So today I'll be talking about something that's, uh, a, I guess, kind of a scientific concept, although it certainly has application in all aspects of life. I'll be talking about something called moral reasoning. And you know what that means, right? You know what moral reasoning is? Are you aware that there's an entire body of research on moral development? Who's aware of that? Now, this has been a, a very thoroughly researched topic. And most of what I'll talk about today uh, comes out of sort of a classic perspective on moral reasoning because there's more contemporary, more modern things and I'll, I'll, I'll talk about the development of the cognitive elements of moral reasoning and some of the um, kind of prerequisites for people in order to, that people need in order to demonstrate what are considered the highest stages of, of moral reasoning. Um, and before I, 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 well, before I talk about that though, I, I want to talk about this guy. Who can tell me who this is? Who's from Russia? Anybody here from Russia? Do you know that man? No reason why you necessarily should, but his name is his name was Vel, uh, Vasily Alexandrovich Arkhipov. Arkhipov? Could I say that? Arkhipov. A R. Arkhipov. Like she said it. <laughs> and there's not necessarily any reason why you would know who he was. He was a Soviet naval officer, and the reason I want to talk about him is because it's a good chance that um, in 1962, uh, October 27th, 1962, at the height of one of the greatest periods of stress between the United States and the Soviet Union, which we know in our country as the Cuban Missile Crisis. Is that something that you've learned about in your countries? Okay. It was, on, it, it was in, it, at the height of that crisis, October 27th, 1962, when it's possible that um, this man saved the world. <laughs> well done, sir. <laughs> so he was flotilla commander and second in command of a nuclear missile submarine. Uh, it was designated B-59. And on that day, he refused to authorize the captain's use of nuclear torpedoes against the United States Navy, which was blockading Cuba at the time. Uh, this, decision requ this decision required the agreement of all three senior officers on board the B-59. And what he did is he was the deciding vote no. So everyone else had, all the other senior officers agreed that yes, this is an appropriate course of action. Um, the political officer agreed this was a course of action. And he said, no, we're not going to do this today. And which was good because in fact, what had happened was a misunderstanding. Uh, but it was a misunderstanding uh, that could readily have led both of our countries to engage in this kind of activity, which would have more or less eliminated life on our planet, or at least life as we know it. So why did he do that? What were the circumstances? The circumstances were there was a breakdown in communication. There appeared to be something happening up above the water. And their orders had been that they were to take action under these conditions. And his position was, well, you know, there's not that much of a cost of waiting. And, you know, he was well aware of what launching a nuclear torpedo against the American warships was going to lead to. And the other officers on the boat lined up behind duty and obligation. And, you know, military officers are trained to obey orders. It's like now is not the moment where you kind of have a debating society about whether we're going to do that. But something in this man said, no, we don't, we are not going to do this. Despite the fact that it could very easily have cost him his career or worse to have been the person who stood in the way of what was a set of standing orders. So we, he made that not happen. How did he do that? What was in him that made him do that? And uh, so the topic today, I don't know what was in him. I don't know what was in his mind, although he later wrote and was interviewed about it. Uh, but I'll, I don't know what in his being allowed him to take the position that he took it to hold it against really overwhelming pressure uh, from others. Um, so, and if there was something special in the development of his character, uh, I think we'd all agree that he made a right move there. He made a moral choice. He acted as an independent moral agent. Uh, and I think that as Montessorians, I think we all understand the value of children adolescents and adults being able to act as independent moral agents as they enter the world and choose to do the right thing, whether or not somebody is looking and whether or not it has immediate personal consequences to them. What does it take to, to help a person become, to create the conditions that help a person become an independent moral agent? And um, that's, I guess that's what we're going to talk about today. Does that sound like the lecture you're hoping to see? It's the only one I've got, and so that's good to hear. <laughs> 
I want to begin by, by contrasting uh, some of what you do and what is done in other places. Uh, you're well aware of the fact that around the world there's increasing pressure on teachers and schools to produce um, changes, positive changes on measures of academic achievement. Typically, we describe them as standardized tests in the United States. Standardized means uniform, norm referenced, and so at least in, um, you know, in the United States, we have pressure to perform well and improve better on standardized tests. Do you have that pressure in your country? Yes. Sure. And in fact, this has been described by Passy Solberg, former teacher and advisor to the Ministry of Education in Finland as the global education reform movement. The global education reform movement is about improving education by, uh, by strengthening evaluation and assessment of education, and that takes the form of performance on norm reference standardized tests. And there's a consequence of that, which is that everything that's not about the content that is on those tests is steadily eroded from a national curriculum when, in fact, a country chooses to focus specifically and only on standardized tests. It's almost as if we're testing this massive hypothesis, the hypothesis being that the only thing that matters in education is how well children do on tests. Okay, we've been testing that hypothesis in the United States for over 20 years, and the global education reform movement, by the way, did you notice that makes the acronym GERM? Yeah. Okay. GERM has been spreading around the world. Certainly, PISA plays a significant role in countries' attention to these sorts of details. And so one consequence of GERM is that everything that's not on the test it becomes diminished in relevance. So I, I can speak for, I have a, a cousin who is a teacher in public school in, in Minneapolis, which is where I live, and uh, she's, you read these crazy things in the press, and you, can it really be true? Can they really be eliminating recess so as to spend more time preparing for tests? And so every once in a while I'll say, we're not doing that here in Minnesota, are we? You know, we've got a strong Scandinavian root population and sensible people and we always have the highest voter turnout in the nation. Minnesota is a great place to be. And even in Minnesota, yeah, they've just eliminated more recess to, to devote more time to performing well on standardized tests. And another consequence of that is it shapes the behavior of teachers and it shapes the culture of the classroom. So um, I'm in my mid-50s. I can tell you when I was a child, school was obviously about a lot of things. It was, uh, it was assumed, it was understood that it's about, sure, learning things, but you know, really it's about social and emotional development and being able to sample and explore different things in the world so children might find out what kind of things light them up and giving them opportunities to find those things that light them up. It was about a lot of things. It was implicit that it was also about self, character, uh, development, as well as content. And when education is only about content, and really only about a couple of content areas, in Minnesota, in the United States, it's English and math. And, and that's it. So we see things like social studies and history and geography and uh, activities like music and art and recess gradually disappearing from the curriculum. It also changes the style of the teacher. So what, what, a, what a good teacher does changes if the only thing that matters in schools is how well children do on standardized tests, then a certain kind of teaching style eliciting a certain kind of behavior becomes the preferred style. And I'm, um, I'm going to show you something that's a little over the top. I'm going to show you a, an example of a, a teacher who's been identified as having exceptionally good classroom management skills. And this is a sample of how she conducts her classroom. I want to be clear that this is a, a demo. So this is a demo of her showing all of her best tricks. And her classroom day does not look like it looks here, but this is her pulling out all of her tricks, demonstrating so that this can be used as instructional material for other teachers working at her grade level. So it's a bit of a caricature, but it rings all the bells that, I'm, that I've talked about. And, and um, uh, I think we're going to have audio, and if we don't, I'm, I'm just going to point the microphone at my speaker. Sound right? Sound okay? This is real. This is a real classroom. This is, this is a real teacher in a real classroom demonstrating some real, you know, real. Um, sorry. Great ideas. Thank you. Yeah, that's right. So here, here you go. Here we go. Here we go. Bodies and chairs. 
bodies and chairs, bodies and chairs, bodies and chairs. I need a very responsible student leader. We'll choose from the names, our nouns, and the student leader today is... Julia! Let's give her a big ten finger woo! Ready? The rules! The rules! The rules of the classroom! The rules! The rules! The rules of the classroom! Rule number one! Follow directions quickly! Rule number two! Raise your hand for permission to speak! Rule Horrifying. Okay, so what offends us? It's a small enough room that, with, of course, it's offensive to us because we have an entire ethos. But what are some of the things that you find most egregious? And I just want to hear from like a couple of people and just like sing out something. Say a thing and we'll hear from more than one, okay? Somebody something. Puppets. Say it again. Puppets. Puppets. Oh, you're, they're becoming trained puppets, yeah. <laughs> what else do we find offensive about it? In the back. Okay, she was doing that, yeah, but see, she's a good puppet. How about in the further back? Uh, keeping the teacher happy. <coughs> yeah, 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 and it goes on from here. Anybody else want to say something? I also like the thing that uh, you should think and say smart things before you yeah. want to say it. Uh -huh. Make, smart choices. It Make smart choices. It was really for me to watch this teacher because she, like, not just inspired by the idea to say, but she's inspired by her children. And I can see it clearly. Yeah. With your emotions, because she is like herself a child, mm -hmm. but she enjoys it. And she, okay. Yeah, in a sense, she's kind of speaking to the child, yeah. and, and a chi she's speaking to the child in a special child voice. Yeah, and, and you're also speaking to something else. She's very satisfied with herself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> she's good at this. They're videotaping her because she's good at this. Yeah. And you notice she's yeah. showing off a little bit, which is, you know, we all do that in life. Well, how about you? Yeah, a condescending voice to children. How about from you? Sounds like brainwashing. Sounds like brainwashing. Whoa. Let's cut, let's, let's cut to the chase, right? Okay, how about you? The amount of time that she spent teaching this yeah. could be time spent doing anything else. The amount of time spent, and, and believe me, we see more ritual. And again, it's, it's, it's a demonstration. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But nevertheless, it took a long time to develop these routines. Yeah. So what could you have been doing instead of memorizing routines that communicate, you know, four elements? Okay. We'll hear from two other people. Let's hear from you. It's scary because it's, it's like it's a lot of 
much of their risk of failure, they could fail. Mm. You know, they could they could you know do something wrong and like there's so little. Some the 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 correct good. path is a narrow one. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and it also was group reward, by the way. That that's what this yeah. was, right? Okay. One more from you, and then from here, and then we'll move on. I want to ask, what is the age of the children? I don't know. I think I think they're about first grade. Okay, I don't, I don't actually know because I got this video yes, from somebody. The, like the thing called, you said that it's routine, daily routine, because uh, according to Marie Montessori, repetition is really important. Yeah. Yes, it is. And that's one of the ways that you learn things like how to do a recitation of a kind of pointless rhyme through repetition. That's right, yeah. And, and, and what's interesting is if you look at, if you look at like a little checklist of currently um, understood to be positive uh, practices within the learning classroom, well, you know what you saw there? You also saw peer teaching, right? Teach the rules to your partner, okay? Uh, you saw something called call and respond, which is also kind of in vogue as a nice way to ensure that you're getting attention while they're repeating things that they're supposed to have learned. And so there's more to this that we don't need to see today, but I just wanted to give us a taste of what the other guys are doing. Mm -hmm. Understand, this is felt to be good practice in many quarters. Let's not forget that for a moment. What we're doing it really is different, and, it, and for someone like that who thinks that her job is to be the boss of the classroom, and, and she knows, she's been trained, because in this model, if they're not looking at you, they're not learning. So part of what you have to do is to be the entertainer, you are the center of the classroom, and there's even like special methodology and training for how to remain the entertaining center of the classroom, okay? Because that's how they learn, because the teacher is the primary agent of instruction in the classroom. Again, it's a different framework, we understand that, but it's a framework that is not offering opportunities, for example, to weigh the consequences of one's actions. It's not given a place where people can discuss what the right thing to do is and why. Uh, those rules were not developed through a, a collaborative process where we explored what would happen in our society here if we didn't have some agreements about how we should conduct ourselves. That's what happens in your classroom, isn't it? The rules are not imposed, they're perhaps arrived at with an understanding that this is how human beings can organize their behavior in such a way as to be supportive and not interruptive of other people and to create a harmonious atmosphere. In fact, you're doing more of this kind of thing, and I don't know how long we'll spend at this, but yeah, this is more like what you're doing. And you might want to ask, uh, what, are, what are children learning here? I mean, in fact, I'm gonna, I, we don't need to hear the sound. So what are children learning here? Let's hear a few more things. They're learning grace and courtesy, so we create a harmonious environment and we demonstrate respect to each other. She's modeling that, she's looking at him, she's at his level. Why is, why, why is self esteem a product here? Yeah. Yeah, that's right. He's not talked over, he's not talked down to. There is a, an adult who is indisputably a person in a senior position of authority who is treating him like a human being. And there's... Uh, the, uh, there, is, uh, there is such uh, unconditional approval of the person and respect for that person being modeled here. I'm a member of this community, yeah, yeah. So, and this is just like what? This is just like checking in. And that's all it is. But already it's different. Already it's, it's completely different. In fact, the whole ethos of this is based on not compliance and order, uh, but on something very different. Uh, for example, this is so inefficient. You know, c c children, ask, ask for help if you need it from Julie. We're going to go outside. Everyone, please hurry up. You need to get outside. You're not seeing that. Are you not seeing uh, well, you know, materials as an instructional device to show them where the different countries go? Uh, so you're seeing something that's different, and, and we don't need to go further on this either. You're seeing something that is a, basically a day in the life of a Montessori classroom. And uh, okay, what are we learning? We're, we're learning that we are human beings, that ultimately we're going to learn that we are, we are independent agents within a community, a community of, of peers, of scholars who respect us and who we respect. And, um, the people in charge are not so much in charge of directing us as creating conditions that are conducive for our work. So, we're learning something different here, and in fact, 
Uh, the case I'm going to make today is that what Montessori offers is pretty much everything that we know about how to foster the development of higher stages of moral reasoning in children. And there might be tips. The tips might be to remember why you're doing what you're doing and to perhaps think about if I'm not doing this, I can find a way to do more, more of it. And God help you, you're going to try to read that, aren't you? You're going to try to read that. <laughs> but I'm showing you this because I'm now going to introduce you to the concept of measurement of moral reasoning skills. And in order to do that, I'm actually going to show you something that's called a moral dilemma. And I don't expect you can read this in the back. Can you read this in back? Oh, well, this day is getting better and better. Okay. So, uh, but because I'm the presenter, I, however, I am going to read it, and I ask that you read it silently while I read it out loud. Okay, this is a classic moral dilemma known as Heinz and the drug. If you Googled Heinz and the drug, this will come up. Okay, and the other thing I want to point out is that this moral dilemma was written in the United States, and it's uh, in its original form. Does it? Do we still have it in there? Yeah, it's slightly modified. Heinz lives in. Uh, town in Europe, okay? And so there's two things about that that I, I find in its original form. Heinz is a man who lives in a town in Europe. One, Heinz is kind of an exotic, not American sounding name. And because this takes place in a fanciful land far away, it's set in Europe, <laughs> okay? okay. But anyway, uh, I'm gonna read it to you and, and please read it. A woman was near death from a special kind of cancer. There was one drug that doctors thought might save her. A druggist in the same town had recently discovered it, but was charging 10 times what the drug cost to make. He paid $200 for the raw materials and charged $2,000 for a small dose of the drug. The sick woman's husband, Heinz, went to everyone he knew to borrow money, but he could only get together about $1,000, half of what it cost. He told the druggist that his wife was dying and asked him to sell it cheaper or let him pay later. But the druggist said, no, I discovered the drug and I'm going to make money from it. So Heinz got desperate and started thinking about breaking into the man's store to steal a drug for his wife. Should Heinz steal the drug? Now, I know what kind of audience you are. <laughs> And uh, you might think that the answer to Heinz and the drug is simple. Of course he should steal the drug. No one should ever be deprived of a drug they need. They shouldn't have to steal it, but in this case, okay, of course he should steal it. It's the right thing to do. Now, who doesn't agree with that, and it's okay? It turns out, okay, thank you for that. Because you know what? It actually doesn't matter what you decide to do. Because the moral reasoning is not... Should he steal the drug or should he not steal the drug? The correct answer is not, yes, he should steal the drug. The correct answer is not, no, he shouldn't steal the drug. It's a dilemma because there's really no correct answer. But what this is used to, to get at is to elicit the thinking that someone applies as they arrive at the decision whether or not Heinz should steal the drug. Because it turns out that how people approach a problem like this Moral problems in general, and actually many related things, uh, how they approach it uh, matters. And there are more sophisticated, more comprehensive, more inclusive ways of thinking about these kinds of problems. And there are, you know, frankly, what would, would have to be described as perhaps a bit more primitive ways of thinking about how to solve these problems. The point that I want to make, though, is that you can make a high-level, principled case for why Heinz should steal a drug, and you can make a high-level, principled case about why he shouldn't steal a drug. Do you understand what I mean? Okay, so let's talk about what some of these cases are. So, you know, so part one of how to respond to a moral dilemma is to say, what is the right thing to do? And um, I, I, made, I made an assumption, a disrespectful assumption, that everyone would say he should steal the drug. There is not a right answer here. But I'm curious, who thinks Heinz should steal the drug? It's okay. It's not, there's not a wrong answer. Who thinks Heinz shouldn't steal the drug? Okay. Who thinks Heinz should live in a society where no man should ever be asked to steal a drug for his wife? <laughs> okay, yes, yes, that's natural, yeah. That makes for less interesting uh, discussion, okay? Because then we're talking, yeah, you get the idea. So what is the right thing to do is one question, and then the real gravy on a moral dilemma is, why is that the right thing to do? And there are many reasons that one can come up with for why he should steal the drug or why he should not steal the drug. And I'm going to show you something from a questionnaire response form. Uh, and we can array them like this. Don't, you can't read that. But what you can see on the right is there's um, um, you know, should steal, should not steal at the very top, can't decide. 
rank the following issues in terms of importance from great to much to some to little to no importance. You understand what I'm saying? You can't read that, I know. But that's how this sort of thing would be arrayed. So it's a kind of a, it's actually a three-step process on this particular measure of moral reasoning. One, what should he do? And then which of these issues, which of these reasons are most to least important? And then at the end, we're going to ask you, um, which are the most important? You follow me? So multi-stages, and maybe you can read that. Uh, so uh, rank these issues in terms of importance. Whether a community's laws are going to be upheld. Okay, important, very important, not important. Uh, is it only natural for a loving husband to care so much for his wife that he'd steal? Is Heinz willing to risk going to jail for the chance that stealing a drug might help? Whether Heinz is stealing the drug for himself or to help someone else, is that relevant? Is that an important issue to consider? Um, whether the druggist rights to his invention have to be respected. What values are going to be the basis for governing how people act towards each other? Whether the druggist is going to be allowed to hide behind a worthless law which only protects the rich anyway. Whether the law is getting in the way of the most basic claim of any member of society. Whether the druggist deserves to be robbed for being so greedy and cruel. Would stealing in such a case bring about more total good for the whole society or not? So which is most important, which is second, and which is third most important? And as you hear these and read them and kind of, some of them resonate. Some might seem a little silly. But every one of these reasons, some people have ranked as the most important or the second most important. And every one of these reasons has been absolutely irrelevant to somebody's decision-making process. I'm kind of curious, what seems, I'm going to start from the bottom, and I want you to raise your hand if you think this is one of the most important. Okay, so would stealing in such a case bring about more total good for the whole society or not? Is that one of the most important? Okay. Uh, whether the druggist deserves to be robbed for being such a jerk. <laughs> is that one of the most important? No. Okay. We got a character here. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I know you don't mean that because you're laughing. Uh, whether the drug is getting in, whether the law is getting in the way of the most basic claim of any member of society, one of the most important. Whether the druggist is going to be allowed to hide behind a worthless law which only protects the rich anyhow, one of the most important. Interesting phrasing. Deliberately so, yeah, deliberately. to elicit from somebody who would elicit a response, yeah, yeah. Whether the druggist should be one of the first ones up against the wall when the revolution comes. <laughs> what values are going to be the basis for governing how people act towards each other? One of the most important? Okay. Uh, whether the druggist's rights to his invention have to be respected? One of the most important? An important one, maybe not the most? Okay, uh, okay I'm just saying. Is Heinz willing to go to jail for the chance that stealing a drug might help? Is he stealing the drug for himself or someone else? For example, you know, is that the basis of whether he's doing the right thing or not? Is it for himself by being selfish or by, for someone else being selfless? Uh, is it only natural for a loving husband to care so much for his wife that he'd steal? One of the most important or one of not? Whether community's laws are to be held, held, upheld? Okay, so yeah, we, we saw some denser smatterings of endorsement than others on some of these. And yeah, th these are reasons that run the gamut from relatively primitive levels of moral reasoning to very high, very kind of abstracted levels. And, and while it might seem like there's something kind of artificial about this, uh, when we encounter situations like this in real life, they elicit an enormous amount of discussion because something that human beings like to do is to discuss the ways that we, sh how we are going to live with other human beings. And in fact, human beings like to talk about the rules and to discuss whether the rules uh, should be changed. And in fact, we had an example this last year in the United States. Uh, this is an EpiPen. You know what an EpiPen is? Yeah. That's a trade name for a self-injector for uh, uh, epinephrine, right, or uh, adrenaline, which is if you have a bee allergy and you get stung by a bee, you got to slam one of these into your thigh or you're going to have anaphylaxis and maybe choke to death, right? Okay, so they used to cost fifty-seven dollars each. You know, it's not like a, it's not, it's not blazing brand new technology. EpiPens have been around for a long time, and a company called Mylan bought the manufacturing rights to this particular to the EpiPen, the trademark EpiPen, and um, they raised the price of EpiPens uh, over multiple trials up to more than six hundred dollars for two of them. 
So what, what was $57 over the course of a little over a year, they raised the price more than once to now $600 a pack. Since 2004, after adjusting for inflation, the price of EpiPens rose more than 450%. And uh, this was a big deal in the United States press and lots of discussion and lots of wringing of hands. And there, were people, there was also people saying, well, you know, it's their product. They, they have the right to choose how they're going to price it. And uh, someone might say it was even a shrewd business move to buy a relatively inexpensive item uh, that is nevertheless not in broad production and then to rack, rack the price up. People were on both sides of this. So the things that we're talking about have to do with what is the right thing to do, construction of what is called moral reasoning. And the science of the study of moral reasoning has been around for decades, and it really, uh, I mean, to be fair, it's been the subject of philosophical discussion for time immemorial. But the way we think about moral reasoning now, the kind of the, the, the modern work that led to us doing things like constructing moral dilemmas as a means of discussing and uh, measuring. It came about through this man, his name is, um, whose name is Lawrence Kohlberg, who is now deceased. Uh, Lawrence Kohlberg was a, a well, he was a, a scientist, a researcher. Um, he, uh, interestingly enough, he, he um, there are moral dilemmas around lots of topics that he's constructed. One of them being, for example, about euthanasia. Okay, so there was a moral dilemma about euthanasia. Uh, as it happens, uh, Kohlberg tragically died of a degenerative neurologic disorder, and, and he chose when he would die because he, he chose to take his own life um, by swimming out into um, Boston Harbor beyond the point where he could swim back. So he actually made a choice that he would end his life as he chose it because of his... Um, deteriorating medical condition. And there's a certain kind of a poetry about that because one of the moral dilemmas he wrote was about the right to take one's own life. Anyway, so that's, and he was actually doing his work right around the time Vasily uh, Arkhipov uh, saved the world. He was actually doing research right around that time. And how someone decides to approach and solve a more a problem that has to do with respecting or not respecting other people's rights or, or making choices about how to be with each other, Kohlberg identified what, uh, what, we're, what we're describing as three stages, three broad stages or approaches. Now, I'm going to say this about stages. Thinking that life, that thinking that cognitive development occurs in stages, you know, like you take these like Piagetian type steps, you know what I'm talking about? Most of you have studied Piaget from you know, pre-operational pre to formal operations in like these stepwise ways. It doesn't really work that way. That's been pretty well worked out. These stepwise developmental models, but it's not really that way. But it's very convenient to be able to talk about human development in this stepwise way because there are characteristic features that seem to sort of fit into stages. It's not really how it happens, how it grows. But anyway, let's talk about Kohlberg's stages of moral reasoning. Stage one, uh, was described. he described it as pre-conventional. Uh, right and wrong is determined by what is going to be punished. In other words, it's actually okay if you can get away with it. You can think of this as the, the decision-making process in a very young child. You know, as long as I'm not in trouble, who's to know? As long as, in, as long as nobody knows, what harm did it do? People base their moral decisions on the fear of punishment, and thus they work to avoid punishment. Children obey because the adults tell them to obey, and if you don't obey, they might punish you. That's stage one. Uh, punishment and obedience, that's what that's called. There's a second stage which seems to emerge a little bit later than that in the lifespan. Uh, that stage is described as self-interest. Right and wrong is determined by what is rewarded or profitable. Um, children obey when it's in their best interest to obey. Sure, steal the drug to save his wife or don't steal the drug because and you, you don't want to miss your wife. Plus, she's a great cook versus uh, don't steal the drug because I don't want to risk going to jail. It would be a real drag to go to jail, you know? Sorry, honey, but I'm not going to jail. I don't want to go to jail. That would be a drag. Those are described as pre-conventional stages. And then there was the, the conventional stage. Um, stage three is called conformity. Heinz should steal the medicine because his wife expects it, and a good husband would steal the drug because that's what good husbands do. That's what people expect from you. If you're a husband, you do this kind of thing. Of course you steal the drug. After all, what would people think of you as a husband if you didn't? If the husband doesn't steal, does that mean he's a bad husband? Well, no, because Heinz could not steal the drug because stealing is bad and he's not a criminal. Okay? 
So in other words, yeah, there, there's a case either way. Steal the, steal the drug because that's what a good husband does. And you don't want to not be a good husband. Or no, don't steal the drug because only criminals steal. And I don't want to be, at least I don't want to be a criminal. I'm not a criminal. Sorry, honey, but I don't, I'm not going to be a criminal. Uh, or of course I will because that's what a good husband does. And so that's, you know, that's the level of analysis. This is what you do. This is what people do. This is what husbands do. Or this is what people who are not criminals do. They don't steal. Stage four emerges after that, and that's described as the law and order stage. Heinz should not steal the medicine because the law prohibits stealing, thus it is illegal. And the thing to do is, what you're supposed to do is what's dictated by the law. Or, Heinz should steal the drug for his wife, but also take the prescribed punishment for the crime, and should pay the druggist what he's owed ultimately. So, do the, do, don't do the crime if you can't do the time. If you do the crime, you have an obligation to do the time and to set up a payment plan <laughs> so that you can you know, create restitution for the crime you have committed. You know, this is interesting because when I was reading, reading the press about you know, Edward Snowden, hero or villain, right? This case was made quite broadly that he was a coward because Snowden did the crime and then he fled to avoid doing the time. And you know, if you're gonna do it, do it, but face the music, you have an obligation to pay the price. That's what courage would be. Courage would be, sure, steal his stuff and take your punishment like a man. That case was made quite emphatically in the press. So what else can we say? Uh, or um, he should, yeah, so yes, steal it if you must to save your wife, but take your punishment. Okay, criminals can't just run around without regard to the law. Uh, actions have consequences. Do they act? Fine. Okay, and you have to take the consequences. How are we doing so far? Interesting. I'm going to move a little faster. I feel like I'm doing a lot of reading. Anyway, stage five, basic human rights. The, now we're entering the post-conventional. Colbert called these pre-conventional and post-conventional uh, because uh, young children tended toward what he described as these pre-conventional stages. They're fairly primitive, but most of society hovers around the conventional level. It's what's normative. Post-conventional, we see fewer people routinely applying these levels of reasoning. So the human rights argument, Heinz should steal a medicine because everyone has a right to choose life regardless of the law. In other words, life trumps written law. Or Heinz should not steal the medicine because the scientist has a right to fair compensation. And you know what, he's not gonna be able to save anyone if he goes out of business or if this you know, technology is lost. So even if his voice is sick, it doesn't make his actions right because after all, the man has a right to his invention, to his creation. And then there's the sixth stage that Kohlberg described, one of uh, what's called universal ethics. Okay, universal human ethics. Heinz should steal the medicine because saving human life is a more fundamental value than the property rights of another person. Life trumps property. Or Heinz should not steal the medicine because others may need the medicine just as badly. And it's their right that they get a shot at it too. Who is Heinz to decide for all of society who gets the drug. There should be a societal, societally fair way that scarce resources get allocated. So these are the stages, you get the idea, right? Have you encountered this before in your education or in your life and work? Uh, no, it looks like prisoners, they are just... Another example of it dealing with a moral yeah, problem. Because yeah. I'm like studying international relations and we have the same course of like scientific approach. And we were studying. Okay. And chicken game also. It's yeah, I, thank you. I, I know these, but I can't describe them. But maybe maybe we'll describe that another time. But yeah, that's 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 right. Yeah. Okay. So um, there are some generally understood principles that it's a, some observations made by Kohlberg and others. Uh, it is possible for a human being to be physically mature, but not morally mature. So it tends to correlate with age and general development, but it doesn't correlate perfectly with age and development. Uh, there does seem to be a relatively invariant and sequential rate of development. And again, it's not stage-wise. These step things that we're used to thinking about, again, like you know, Piagetian stages, they're not really stages. But there are points when people begin to, you know, it starts overlapping. Doing more of stage four than stage three at some point, and I think continue to evolve. Eventually doing more of stage five, but there's not these perfect cutoffs. But there does seem to very clearly be a sequence to this. And that people at stage five didn't get there by hopscotching around age, uh, stages uh, uh, three and four. 
You understand what I mean? There is a maturational process at work here. Uh, people cannot comprehend moral reasoning at a stage more than one stage beyond their own. And you also see experience, uh, evidence of this when, when people are publicly debating uh, moral issues before them. Uh, in fact, one of the ways that you can help promote someone's level of moral reasoning is to make an argument that is suited to them by reaching them at about like a half a stage beyond where they are now. In other words, there really isn't one message that drives everyone forward. If you are talking above their head, it just sounds like mumbo jumbo. They cannot make cognitive sense of it. It's kind of like if you handed a child a material that was, you know, eight or nine months beyond what they were doing right now in the prepared environment. Well, there's an intent, there's a purpose for that material, but the child can't glean that purpose. It's too far beyond them. And it's the same thing with making discussions around moral development, or moral reasoning. And so in some sense, you can see people like actually talking across each other. If you were to analyze their argument when they're talking about a, a societal issue, you may well find that somebody's very clearly here and somebody's very clearly here. And yeah, they actually can't hear each other. Well, okay, this one could hear this one, but this one cannot hear that one. This one hears this one and says, no, you're crazy for the following reasons. And they might be right, but it doesn't matter because they're not going to convince this person by making a more advanced case that is relatively incomprehensible to them. Uh, speaking of incomprehensible, I'm well aware of the fact that I'm kind of coffeeed up and underslept and I'm probably speaking too fast. I'll try to slow down, I'm sorry. Some other things that are known, people are attracted to reasoning that is one stage above their own, their own present level, because it's intriguing. Because yeah, you know, I can taste it, and that sounds a little more adequate. That's, oh, interesting. I think I get what you mean. Let me see if I understand what you're saying. Because if we did it this way, then everyone would have a fair shot. You understand what I'm saying? It's just like with the materials in the Montessori classroom. They're drawn to the stuff that is just, just, a, just a little bit above where they're at. They're drawn to it. It's like it's, it's nature's design that we want to reach. If we can see it, we'll reach for it. We won't reach for it if we can't see it, but if it, it, it's intriguing to us when it's almost right there. Um, movement through stages is affected when a person's dominant cognitive outlook is not adequate to cope with a given moral problem. Okay, so let me put that in some context. Higher stages of moral reasoning do not emerge unless there's a need for it. So in a small, like agrarian village, with, with say, you know, 50 people, 30 people, you're never going to develop really past maybe the earliest stages of conventional reasoning because that's perfectly adequate to solve the social problems that you'll encounter in a small little collective of human beings who all know each other. And, you know, I, I know you, I know, I know your parents, I know where you live. You're not going to steal from me uh, because you can't possibly get away with it. Now, <clears throat> in the same way, uh, the use of, of contracts, of written contracts, that doesn't have to emerge until you get into a, uh, into a social group that's larger than, that's large enough that people don't all know each other and have strong relationships with them. Okay, so you don't really see contracts evolving until it's important that it be written down because there's no certainty that everybody who was around when it happened is there to confirm or deny that, it, that the agreement was made in the way that, that we're claiming it was made. You understand what I mean? So it's the same thing here. Higher stages incorporate the thinking and experience of all lower stages of reasoning into current levels of reasoning, but transcend them um, so as to create more, uh, more abstract, more comprehensive solutions to, uh, to social problems. So how can we help people become, well, how do, how, so I think we all agree as Montessorians that higher stages of moral reasoning are kind of the kind of thing we're looking for. How can we foster the growth of higher stages of moral development? Well, there's been part of what Kohlberg and others have done is to experiment with ways that we can kind of like pump up somebody's way that they think about what the right thing to do, improve the adequacy of their answer to what is the thing that we should do. And one of the, one of the ways that he, he and his colleagues began with was to look at case studies of moral exemplars. Um, so there would be a discussion of the biography, actions, and values of people like, uh, well, like Martin Luther King. You know, we have a pretty good moral exemplar in our community. I don't know. <laughs> How did Montessori view society? And 
Um, you know, Gandhi is a classic example. You know, just uh, I just added a slide today because I sat there backstage, awed by Scylla Ellsworth. Uh, that's a moral exemplar, and and the courageous things that she's done that she talks about very normally, and the people that she knows who haven't survived their moral convictions. You know, that that yeah, for example, and and wasn't she a, a human human being too, right? Talk about an accessible person, and an accessible role model. I, mean, I, I, I don't know about you, but I was thinking, at some point I thought, you know, she's, she's an extraordinary person, but I can see the normalness of your human beingness. And uh, it's not a hard trip to, gosh, you all, she's remarkable, but I can see, I got, a, I got a path into that remarkable. All I have, human beings learn how to be human beings from other human beings. And so when we had examples like Dr. Ellsworth around, it's very easy to try on their minds and think about how it would be for them and then to experiment how it might be for you. And in fact, there's a whole literature. Of William Bennett is actually a conservative um, kind of talking head in this day and age, but he wrote the Book of Virtues as a way of presenting a whole series of classic stories of moral courage and people doing the right thing, okay? And documenting, this is, this is why we do what we do, this is how we do it. Uh, I was a little disappointed when I came across this in my study of Kohlberg. And I, I used, um, the, actually I used the test in my dissertation research 20 years ago that we just were talking about, and I'll tell you more about it in a minute. But yeah, Heinz and the drug was one of the measures that I used in my dissertation research. Uh, but one of the disappointments was that it turns out the surest way to improve scores on moral, moral dilemmas is to talk about how to solve moral dilemmas. <laughs> it kind of sounds like a different version of teaching to the test. But you can do it in a way that is not prescriptive. You can talk about these, what, what would happen if, if we had smaller groups and had time, we could actually like distribute a bunch of moral dilemmas and we could have uh, literalist group discussions about why, you know, what are the most important issues? You know, one, what we should do, and, and what are the most important issues in deciding what we should do? And people get exposure to other people's reasoning in these kinds of, you can say there's something artificial about having a moral discussion, discussion group, and it is a little artificial, but it turns out that because people learn from other people's ideas, and you know, like that, that plus 0.5 or that plus one case that somebody's making, you can say, oh my God, I never thought of it that way, yes. That, is a, that provides a much more complete solution to this problem. And so people can learn in this applied way. No, no, I mean, the point is it's not an applied way. But you can nevertheless learn from thinking and talking with other people about what we should do and why. And people can pick up, you know, the kind of like moral tips from thinking. Because you've just never thought about it that way before. But now that someone's exposed you to it, it's kind of like, oh, yeah. Yeah. And then it would work better for everyone, wouldn't it? Yeah, I guess it would. And so that's a very effective way to improve uh, people's level of moral reasoning. So moral exemplars, dilemma discussions, probably look something like this. Well, I believe, or the way I see it. Jessica, what's your view? <laughs> it's like a TV chat show, I guess. But another way that I think will, will resonate very strongly with you, another way that we can improve people's level of moral reasoning is for them to uh, participate in just communities. Well, I get a shiver when I think about what a just community must be, because you know what a just community is. So in 1974, Colbert began working with schools to set up democracy-based school programs, where both students and teachers were given one vote to decide on school policies. Now, the purpose of these programs were to build a sense of community in schools in order to promote democratic values and increase moral reasoning. And so, um, in, this, in this sense, Kohlberg's work on the developing the just community concept was uh, very much driven by uh, his experience living on, in an Israeli kibbutz when he was a young adult in 1948. So, he had experience of what he came to think of as a just community and said, what if we created conditions in schools that were similar to what he felt were the most salient elements of that? And we have schools that are, that are not Montessori schools, but that are like 100% democratic schools. And um, you can come across these in the media. And in fact, uh, I've heard it described as a democratic school. We might call it, a, what's another term that people might use for that kind of, what would another name? 
it's one example of really like progressive education and somebody who's doing something that they would call progressive or student centered would very likely incorporate this as sort of part of what they're doing. Okay, where everybody, like, again, what's exciting about it is that it's a democracy. The students have each a vote, the teachers each have a vote, and the teachers aren't the ones who are in charge. Um, I, and uh, who here is from the United States? Just so I can see, okay. You've listened to This American Life, that, that, you know, that radio magazine. About two and a half years ago, they did an entire episode, and then the episode was called 100% Democracy. They did a whole hour on visiting this school in Brooklyn, which was exactly this. I don't remember them saying, but they surely had their roots in Kohlberg's work here. And some of these are very enduring examples, and uh, they have a lot of meetings, a lot of discussions, and they're very fair about how they conduct business. And what do the children learn by participating in that just society? So there's the model of the kibbutz, and you know, and there's a Montessori classroom. Because while it's not 100% democracy, and uh, well, I don't think we have to decide whether it is or isn't, but. It does involve that we are all participants in a community, we're all equal partners in a community. And it also involves all the other things that you need to potentiate children for the highest stages of moral development, okay? It's not just that social environment that you know so well, but it also incorporates essential cognitive and social developmental aspects that, you know what, Montessori was not a student at Kohlberg's, no she wasn't, but if she had been, it wouldn't have looked any different. Okay, it would not have looked any different. And then don't we encounter that over and over, where we, we discover some really good developmental, valuable thing, and it's like, well, <laughs> I hate to keep saying it, but you know, we got that covered too. And by we, of course, I mean Montessori got that covered too. So I'm gonna talk about some other research. Uh, and again, I'm coming out of what would be described as the classic moral reasoning school, okay? And I can talk about some modifications to that, I will. But I want to talk about the, the um, again, stages aren't real, but you can think of them as tendencies. And this is from an article written by Walker. No, I don't have the citation here, but I can provide it for you easily. And Walker identified parallel stages in cognitive, perspective taking, and ultimately moral development. Because, in, in fact, to be able to, and don't worry, you don't have to read that, I'm going to describe some, I'm, I'm mostly having there symbolically, so you can see the article where it came from, but I don't have any expectation that you can read that. If you want to, you can, but I'll tell you about it. And what Walker, well, what, what, what was, the point is, is that it turns out that there's a requirement for an, a certain intellectual level to be able to reach the higher stages of moral reasoning, okay, like, um, and I keep, there's a reason why first graders don't generally spout universalizable principles of human justice. Okay, from a, from a cognitive developmental standpoint, it's really hard to get them past, yeah, but my mom might be mad at me, okay? Because that's what their world is. That is their cognitive landscape. And so in order to think about things like, uh, you know, Rawls's concept of interchangeability as the foundational basis for making decisions about how to rule society, how to manage society, well, interchangeability, what does that mean? It means you've got to be able to, to look at a problem from a source of detachment to say, well, the way we ought to set it up is that everyone would agree that it was fair not knowing where they might find themselves in the social order. You understand what I mean? Interchangeability. Well, what do you need cognitively to do in order to actually think of what it would, you know, think of how to abstract yourself from a situation such that you are simultaneously fitting yourself into the perspective of any one of the players who would be a participant in that. That's a level of abstraction of self that requires a level of abstraction of cognition, okay? But being able to abstract cognitively alone isn't enough because there's other things that you have to do to get to that realization of the, uh, almost an end point of moral reasoning. Set up a world so that no one gets to pick where they're gonna land, but everyone would agree that it's fair, okay? That's basically the, you know, the maximum level of interchangeability. Anyway, so there are cognitive stages that are predeterminates for these, what are, how, what we're described, it's not like all steps, you think of it like tendencies, okay? There are cognitive stages necessary for these stages of moral reasoning. And in fact, we'll, we'll say that it's not just cognitive stages, but let's start with that. You need to have sufficient cognitive capacity to even conceptualize the problem, okay? To even conceptualize all the elements of the problem. But you also need to have the social capacity to imagine what it would like to be Jonathan on the wrong side of this particular issue. 
So you've got to also know what it is to step into somebody else's shoes. And, um, and, and that is how you can begin to formulate, you know, what's, what's the thing to do. But you also have to be motivated to step into somebody else's shoes. Because uh, the history is full of people who absolutely knew what it was like to be that other person and still screwed the other person, okay? And that, you could almost argue, okay, I said that word, is that okay? Don't tell Mirka, okay? No, so the point is, is that, yeah, I mean, you actually, you, there are, history is, you know, countless examples of people at, at very high stages of cognitive capacity who absolutely knew what it was like to be on the wrong side of something and still did the thing that was harmful to others. So you have to actually choose to do the right thing, okay? You have to choose to do it. And, and one of the, well, I think one of the, because I'm, I, I'm not expert at adolescent Montessori work. I, I, I offer a, does valorization of the personality play a role in, in saying, I, I am a respected, unique individual in this community, and out of respect for this community that I value, that I am a part of, um, I will really not choose not to act at my highest level of moral reasoning. Okay? I mean, that's a little abstract. You understand what I mean? I wonder if one element that supports that is that sense of valued and valuing within a social community, within a social enterprise. So I'm getting ahead of myself with this diagram, but I'm gonna talk about each of these stages now. You with me so far? It's a brand new lecture, and so I, I, I haven't done it yet to tune it up before the Congress, but we're doing okay so far? Yes. Okay. So first I wanna talk about executive functioning, which we've heard about already, and uh, to acknowledge the, the brilliant work by Dr. Lillard. And we can go back to her 2006 article because we always have to go back there because that is the single best piece of research on Montessori education ever done with the exception of what might be coming out next, I don't know. But the reason this is so valuable is, and the reason it was published in one of the most prestigious journals in the world is because it was just exemplary experimental design. The one thing that has been missing from Montessori, one of the two things, one thing has been an independent rating of Montessori implementation apart from this study and there are two approaches to solving that problem that are coming down the pike. There was a time when for example uh, people who were AMI trained would say well it's got to be AMI, that's got to be the best and it probably is but it, somebody else could be channeling Montessori and they have to get credit for the quality of what they're producing, right? So we can't have training be the determinant of what we think is good or not good. It's got to be the thing itself. And what was been missing up until this generation is some independent way of saying, yep, we all agree, that is really excellent Montessori. We don't know where they trained, but we know what we see. So there's two solutions to that that are kind of in the development right now in the pipeline. We can talk about them another time or maybe later today. And the second thing that, so she didn't have that, but she had excellent Montessori, indisputably excellent Montessori, AMI trained teachers, and, and she had it in a public school system in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and because so many people wanted to go to those schools, there had to be a lottery system, so she had the one thing, the magic thing. She had a randomized assignment to Montessori for those who won the lottery, and conventional for those who didn't win the lottery. So that, because of that level of experimental design, that's why this is like the most important outcome study on Montessori. And, uh, and so we're going to talk about executive functioning, this cognitive capacity. She spoke about it, and she used, in fact, uh, really two measures of this thing that's called executive functioning, which can readily be related to normalization. She used a laboratory measure, uh, actually a card sorting task, that uh, is similar to some work that we're using, using a laboratory measure that actually runs on an iPad, that is a, a cognitive task that is easy, straightforward, widely used in research on executive functioning, definitely captures the thing we're talking about. It's not a measure of normalization, but then executive functioning isn't the same thing as normalization. It's sort of the cognitive requirements to demonstrate normalization. She also used an observational measure. Uh, it's the only one on the Montessori site that's low, that goes down, it's that brown line. And that was an observational measure of uh, something they described as ambiguous rough play on the playground. So you know what ambiguous rough play looks like, right? They're either playing or they're fighting. <laughs> they're either laughing or they're crying. I can't tell what they're doing and I'm not sure they can either. That's ambiguous rough play. So she had two measures that captured this thing of self-control and um, specifically the card sort for executive functioning. And that's a necessary requirement because you've got to be able to simulate in your mind what the world looks like from that person's shoes. 
And where you simulate it is in an aspect of that of cognition that's described as working memory. So when I ask you to visualize Mirka, think about what she looked like this morning, you're going to put an image of her in your head and examine it. Okay? You're going to place it in visual working memory and, and do something with it. Okay? That's working memory. That's one of the aspects of executive functioning. And if you don't have good working memory, you can't hold what it's like to look at the world from somebody else's perspective long enough to think about what they might be feeling or what they might be experiencing. So you've got to hold it. Now, uh, I've spoken about executive functions before, and I think others have as well, but once you put on the lenses of executive functioning and begin to examine the Montessori environment, what you see is that this is a laboratory that might as well have been designed from the ground up to promote the development of, of all of these sort of primary aspects of executive functioning. And that's just like, you know, you, uh, you can say zero to nine, Certainly most concrete during three to six when, you know, for example, what are we doing? I'm, I'm observing. Do you want to play with the spindle rods? Oh, yes, I do. But I'm not going to out of respect for my, car, my friend here because we don't get to interfere with another child's work. It's one of the rules that we have in our just society. And you, you know it better than me. So what do they do? They put their hands in their pocket. They sit on their hands. They hold them behind their back. They almost like dance around like they maybe have to go to the bathroom because they're trying to not, they're practicing. Oh, they're practicing not interfering, which is essentially the definition of inhibitory control. They're practicing inhibiting the impulse to leap in and interfere. Okay, so that's one of the fundamental strands of executive functioning, inhibitory control. I've already talked about working memory, which is our space of simulation. And uh, for what it's worth, a third component is called cognitive flexibility, the ability to shift and do something different when conditions change or when your anticipated outcome isn't met. You know with me on these things? Okay. And we now know, by the way, and of course this is an embodied, this is an embodied physical practice of, inhibit of inhibition, practicing inhibitory control with the body, with his body. And this is another example of practicing physical control. You might know it as balance and coordination. I don't know, do you know it as balance and coordination? A lot of people would view it as that. But, uh, but what's now understood in a way that it wasn't understood, even as little as 10 years ago, hey man, self-control, that's what we want. And that's why, that's why people who have good self-control do better in school and in life. Because they, they can control what they're going to do, right? I choose to not eat the hamburger, therefore I might be healthier. I choose to not go out and play because I have to prepare for an exam. And whether or not we like exams, it's going to have some impact on my future tomorrow. Self-control. Well, okay, so what, what it means is I will execute motor movements that are different ones from reaching for the brownie or the cookie and putting it in my mouth. I will not perform those motor movements, that behavior of eating the wrong food, and I will make some other complex behavioral activity. So I'm putting this in, in the muscle movement terms because we now know that cognition is, cognition is simply movement without movement, okay? And so when we are thinking about doing things, well, what is it doing, right? The things that we would be doing would be complex behaviors. And in fact, you can't think about doing anything that does not involve some doing. And the doing is physical movement, it's complex motor behaviors, and self-control begins with controlling the self. In fact, self-control only is controlling the self, and the self is the body. You know, the, the, the self expresses its agency through movement. I don't know, right? So if you want to... Um, so, and it's a fundamental aspect of executive functioning, okay? That's what executive functioning is, is, is designing, uh, simulating, and producing complex behaviors, or, or not, or not producing those behaviors, producing some other behaviors. And so, you guys are in a behavior laboratory for developing, practicing, emitting, or, or in some cases, not emitting complex behaviors. And, and that's what the brain is for. That's the purpose of the brain, to behave or to not behave to move or to not move, to act or to not act, to cho or to choose not to, or, or to act by not acting, <laughs> okay? So that's all you do. I mean, you're, you're a sensory motor curriculum that is refining and tuning the, um, you know, the spectrum of complex sensory motor couplings that make up what it is to be an agent in the world.
Not too abstract, I hope. So you're developing executive functions. There's probably nothing that's more directly supporting the formation of executive functions than the sensory motor curriculum, the movement-based curriculum that is Montessori. But you also have to know enough about what it is to be a human being to be able to use that simulation capacity to simulate another human mind. And that's where perspective taking, perspective taking is another necessary element to be able to make a moral decision. And we can only take the perspective of another person if we can actually hold them, if we have the cognitive requirements to be able to simulate another mind. So we gotta have the cognitive capacity. We develop that cognitive capacity like no one else in Montessori. And then we afford them opportunities to get endless practice of perspective taking. To be the six-year-old who remembers how it was to have, who remembers what it was like to be a three-year-old in that children's house, and who treats them kindly and respectfully uh, as they do, as they were treated kindly and respectfully. Or when a teacher says, can you, um, you know, can you help Julia with her smock, whatever that is maybe, and, and you remember being helpful with a smock, and maybe even you noticed that she had her sleeve in the wrong part and was having trouble with it. Well, you know what that's like, and so you, you go and you help them, or you look after another child, as you do, because this is what we do in our community. So you've got to have practice, of, you know, practice, practice, practice at controlling the body, because self-control begins with controlling the self. Your self is your body. There's not a self riding around in this thing that is your body. And you've got to have opportunities to practice and experience, what, to interact with others, to be interacted with, and to interact with others. And Lillard just character, characterized that as well. So here we see the, the false belief, the social cognition task that she also used. Also superior in Montessori. We are developing the superior cognitive foundations and providing endless practice opportunities to develop the perspective taking requirements, the simulating what life would be like for others in this situation, to really directly experiencing it oneself and then acting accordingly. And so, okay, so those are the, those are the cognitive and social perspective taking elements necessary to formulate the kind of moral thinking that Kohlberg uh, was describing. Now, um, now, the Kohlbergian kind of classical style of approach to moral reasoning has been criticized for a couple of reasons. One by a researcher named Carol Gilligan, who asserted that, that Kohlberg's moral reasoning very much speaks what she described as a very cognitive, very almost masculine, absent of uh, sensitive, warm emotions. It's a very intellectual activity. She posited that there might be, in fact, a more feminine voice for moral reasoning. The masculine voice is logical and individualistic, meaning that the emphasis is on moral, de on moral decisions, is in protecting the rights of people and making sure justice is upheld. All worthy, all worthy, for sure, but incomplete. You understand what I mean by incomplete? Gilligan's perspective was that there was a feminine voice in moral decision making that placed more emphasis on protecting interpersonal relationships and taking care of other people, particularly people who are at some disadvantage to others. So helping those who need help and maintaining relationships between people. Um, so that, that was one critique that was raised, Gilligan's critique. And um, rather than being a logic and individualistic perspective, this focused more on what was described as a care perspective. That meant focusing on the needs of the individual in order to make an ethical decision. And then finally, the man who served on my research committee as a, as a grad student, James Rest, one of Kohlberg's protégés, um, really spoke about the importance of moral motivation because their history is full of people who could conceive of the highest level of moral behavior and could choose not to employ that highest level of moral behavior. And in fact, we probably do that every day. There are things that we know might be the right thing to do that would be more inclusive and would be a more adequate solution to the social problem of the indigent person in the street who needs money or food from us. Uh, and we too don't always act at the highest level of moral motivation. I'm gonna close by talking a bit about uh, some other elements in, in Montessori experience that, that might not directly point to how they contribute to moral development or to moral behavior. But uh, these are things that I've observed that I think um, are worthy of investigation and um, maybe could be investigated in some systematic manner. One of them is the seat of moral motivation. Why do we choose to use our highest level of moral reasoning? So we might be able to solve the dilemma at like a whopping level six, but we might be spending a lot of our time acting at like a level four, you know, which is not a sin, 
but it's certainly not as comprehensive and as encompassing as acting out of level six. You with me on that? So I want to I want to critique a little bit about how we try to foster moral motivation in conventional education and and put that in light of some things that you do in Montessori that I think serve a far more are far more potent in doing that. But I don't know if they're discussed as generators of moral motivation within the Montessori community. I'd be interested in your thoughts about that. So one of the things that most children in most schools, at least in North America and presumably in other places in the world, is an admonition to celebrate diversity. Now, I value diversity. And, I, and the older I've gotten, and maybe, dare I say, the wiser I've gotten, the more I realize that, that diversity is an absolute survival characteristic for our species, and probably for any species. Because you don't know where the best ideas are going to come from. In fact, it, as, you know, probably throughout history, the best ideas have come from some of the least obvious places. And so um, just you know, on the face of it, we really don't want to wipe out species because they play a part. And they, they may play a not obvious part in some you know, vast, complex, interconnected ecosystem. But because we don't know how that system works, it's best not to like, annihilate entire species, much less ecosystems, right? Yeah, well, it's only one little ecological niche, but you don't know what that little ecological niche that was that mountain that we just leveled. You don't know how that affects everything else. I mean, you heard that the butterfly effect, right? So one small thing in an non-obvious ways affect other things when they're part of a complex system. And what is life, earth, <laughs> humanity, but a complex system? So that is a really good reason to celebrate diversity. But I think that you would agree it's, if we were to try to frame that in kind of moral developmental or moral reasoning terms, it's a pretty abstracted level, right? Not the area that children in, at age 9, 10, 11 are operating within. And, and so it's reason, it makes sense to make an admonition. We celebrate diversity. We welcome all of our differences, even as humans routinely create us's and them's on the most trivial of factors. Human beings create us's and them's spontaneously, dare I say naturally, on the most trivial of dimensions. So in some sense, we're, yeah, we are saying celebrate diversity. That is correct. But I don't think the admonition to celebrate diversity is the most meaningful case that can be made. Six ways to celebrate diversity in the classroom. There it is. Education is replete with these kinds of things. Nine ways. Okay, turns out there's nine ways to celebrate diversity. But you know what Montessori did is she didn't really talk about tolerance. She didn't talk about uh, how we celebrate. Well, you'll know better than me whether she talked about how we must celebrate how each of us is different and how we look different and how we have different food and our bodies create different smells based upon the food and that we wear different clothes. She didn't really talk about how that in itself was great the way you would in a lot of educational settings. This is great. And somebody used the term brainwashing to describe the, the classroom we saw at the beginning. Because I've observed when I've been in schools that there's an element of, this is great, you know? Because it's great. Because we should. Okay? And I think what Montessori has is a vastly more adequate approach to fostering moral motivation. Who wants to guess what that is? If somebody says it, then I know I'm on the right track. Okay, you don't need to make a guess. I'm going to say this. The fundamental needs of man. Yeah. Why? Yeah. Why? Why does that make sense? Because I had this thing, and yesterday I like, uh, was uh, translating the lecture of Bill Conway, and he used, used this. Yeah, he okay. He was talking about it. So, um, those people look funny, their food smells funny, and they wear funny clothes. They're not like me. And believe me, I can find a million reasons why they're them. But if I understand that everybody needs a house, and some houses look like this and some look like this, and the reason a house might look like this or like this has to do with the fact that people create shelter with the materials that are present in their environment where they happen to have landed on the planet. And that shelter is a fundamental yeah, a fundamental human need. And, and you can learn about all the ways that humans create shelter, and you can have this, draw, this dawning realization that, my God, isn't it ingenious? Humans are ingenious. Because they find a way, we find a way, to create shelter wherever we happen to be. And, you know, so it is with, uh, well, so it is with every other 
fundamental human need. And so things like different kinds of attire, different clothing, different food, it doesn't become a basis of how we and them are different and how we have to all choose to get along and celebrate these differences. What these are is different manifestations of the unique, you know, of, the, of the universal attributes that all human beings share. That they make the adornment out of what they have in their environment. They eat the food that's available in their environment. And, and we all do these things. And, and suddenly culture becomes not something that's potentially threatening, but perhaps a, a source of endless curiosity. Like, oh my God, and how do they, how do they? feed themselves over there and, and over there. And where, do they, where does their clothing come from? And it's got to be, and maybe you've witnessed this or maybe you've even said it, isn't it remarkable? Uh, isn't it remarkable how we all, we all solve these problems and how we all find a way to advance, you know, to, to survive. I don't, know that you, I don't know that that's directly expressed because you're the experts and I'm not, but I, I think that that is a very natural, well, one, it's true, you know, it's actually correct. And it's a very easy in to curiosity about different cultures and different spiritual um, requirements. You know, something that, that I, I have to admit I learned relatively embarrassingly recently is uh, what, under what spiritual need See, where does, um, oh, I can't read, I can't, it's a little small for me to read. Everybody likes to look good, don't they? Vanity. Vanity, yeah, okay, thank you for that, yeah. I find that fascinating. You know, when I first said vanity, that doesn't sound positive, that doesn't sound, but yeah. You too looked in the mirror this morning and tried to fix your hair. And you know, somebody in Africa looked in the mirror this morning and tried to fix their hair, and somebody in South America did the same thing, and uh, somebody in Asia adjusted their clothing so it was smooth and, and changed shirts or tunics because this one was dirty. And when you start realizing that this is a fundamental human need, I mean, where else would it sit, right? Of course it's going to sit under spiritual because it has something to do with our relationship with, I don't know, the universe, the world, something like that. And so I think that, that, that nobody in conventional education knows anything about this. And so what they're doing is they're admonishing children to celebrate the, the differences that, uh, and, I, and I believe that, that that works, that's effective. I believe it can also be um, something that is almost a brainwashing thing. It's teaching a kind of rule. It's teaching a kind of rule. And understanding the fundamental human needs is an imitation to a discovery of other cultures. Not a, yes, I know, we have to celebrate diversity, we have to tolerate people who are not like ourselves. Yes, I understand that, because I've observed that, maybe you have too. But uh, what a thing it would be to observe children drinking in other cultures, because isn't it fascinating how we all solve these problems? Okay, so we're almost done. What else do I want to say? I think I'll skip. Uh, well, okay. Well, to be fair, yeah. So, so um, I, you know, we see evidence of this in social cognition and references to justice in Lillard's study. I mean, we're seeing, we're seeing the constituent elements necessary for higher stages of moral reasoning present in the curriculum, in the pedagogy, the results shown in Lillard's work. But we're also seeing the consequences of that: um, positive shared play, references to justice, and. Um, you know, and also an awareness of the vast interconnectedness of the things on this earth. You know, uh, I, I, uh, I used to say, I haven't sat in a lecture for a while, but I think it fits here, is that it seems to me that a Montessori child would never go on to build a smokestack. Because uh, that maybe solves a local problem of pollution. But what comes out of that yeah, is it's going to land on somebody somewhere. And they know that. And so I think that a respect for the entirety of, of the planet is something that's you know, just completely baked in to Montessori. And, and uh, congratulations, you are, you are forming a moral giant. How about that? Good for you. And thanks for coming here today. So that's the end of our time. Well, we have four minutes left in our time, and I'm happy to spend those four minutes. Y yes, I'd like to ask you to spend those four minutes with me, because I want to hear from you, first from you, on something, but I want to hear in general about the fundamental needs business, because I'm definitely out of my depth with this. And it's, it's, this is, I purely took this up, that this seems to be a real route to moral motivation. And I want to be respectful to those who have vastly more superior knowledge to my own in this domain. But I'd like to hear from others uh, on that topic. But first, you raised your hand. Okay. Um, it 
actually, I used to live in the San Pro, uh, Ilim Prairie, Minnesota. I know that town. 18 years. Yeah. And I moved back to Turkey. Yeah. And now I'm coming from Turkey. I have question about EpiPen. Yeah, a, a question about the EpiPen. Yeah, my understanding is you apply it to your thigh and what? <laughs> EpiPen went up. Yeah. Before Trump or after Trump? <laughs> well, it wasn't because of Trump. It was before Trump. It was when somebody just yeah they some pharmaceutical company bought this other company that made the yeah. EpiPen, and because no one was going to stop them, they said, well, we kind of own the market on self injecting. Uh, uh, Adrenaline. So why why don't we charge whatever we can for it? And and they did, and it caused an outrage. But they still didn't lower the price. Actually, my real question okay. is: uh, uh, there's the uh, actually um, professor in Boston. Uh, his name is Peter Gray, and Peter Gray. Yeah, okay. I, know, I, I, I know the name, but maybe you can say yeah. some more about him. Yeah, he believes that the schools are prison. Yeah, well, he's not alone in that view. I'm, I'm so, yeah. he, Peter Gray, professor in Boston, believes yeah. that schools are like prison. And I say, yeah, he's not alone in that view. But anyway. I mean, I just, I'm just trying to do more research about his ideas. And yeah. actually, I just noticed a small note. Uh, he's OK with the Montessori, which is good. Of course he is, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, one way to think about this is that you know, it's the same human being, the universal human being. And, uh, okay, the, the professor who says schools are like prison, we're probably going to agree with them on a few elements. Yeah. And, and just like different pedagogical approaches that create the same sort of developmental environment for human development, it's the same human. And so I, I think we would all agree that Montessori really has a vastness and a comprehensiveness, but she's not alone in understanding that we, need, that we can create conditions that facilitate the self-creation, or oh, the self-creation of a moral agent, but I mean the self uh, auto education, self development. So I think that you can recognize friends in other curricula or in other pedagogies. I don't think any of them are as comprehensive as Montessori, but yeah. So Montessori would have to be respected by somebody who understood how to facilitate moral growth in children because the process is the same no matter what you call it. There's going to be common ground. Thanks for that. Anybody else want to say anything else? Anyone want to offer something about the fundamental needs of man? Sir? So what struck me in that conversation about diversity is being from the U.S., we have these uh, celebratory months, Black History Month, Women's History Month, all of that stuff. And there's always been a dichotomy trying to figure out whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. Yeah. Quote, unquote, right? Of course, from a couple of days ago, who knows, right? Um, <laughs> but the, that, that same level of Okay, let's celebrate diversity to get it in people's faces. Yeah. Right? I think you are spot on with the Montessori fundamental needs as being the progenitor of that moral development. Uh, I used to teach astronomy at college, and looking at this image that you have right now was my way of doing that same type of thing. Mm -hmm. I'm saying, look, that's it. It's all there is. Yeah, yeah, right Every on. Every single human being that ever has been and ever is. Right there. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so in, res in, re in response to the first thing you said, yeah, I mean, I think that it's important that, that people from all backgrounds feel like they have a stake and a place in a society. And I understand what you mean. Let's, yeah, let's make sure that there is an acknowledgement of all cultures in some way or another. But then let's try to acknowledge all cultures by not necessarily reducing every culture to a sort of a stereotypic projection or image of some superficial attribute, you know? And, and I think that's the trouble. I think we're in agreement that the trouble is, it ends up being that somebody from Thailand uh, is now reduced to having to wear a Thai costume on Thai day, you know, or whatever. Right. You, you understand what I mean, right? Yes. It's like, well, why, why, why were they appointed to doing that? There is more than the fact that some people, some people in Thailand wear clothes that look like that some of the time. So it ends up being this, it ends up being an, an imposed superficiality about it. That very much is about those things that are really not the things that matter. It's not that they look different. It's that they also do clothes, right? Yeah. Can I hear, yeah. Thank you for that. Can I hear from you? So I'm here at a school in Prague, and we last year got an EU grant about um, inclusion and to set a methodology for Czech teachers about inclusion in schools and what you could do. And they wanted us to focus on cultural. Uh, diversity mm -hmm. within schools for the most part, and values, which kind of was like, okay, we have to apply for this grant because it's stupid if we don't. Um, and so we 
when, as our school set about starting this grant, and we're in the first year of our two-year program, um, we're using the fundamental needs as a basis mm -hmm. for all of our work. Mm -hmm. And it's really been, um, we, because we have to focus on like a culture each month, we have to <laughs> sure. kind of yeah. do some of this kind of cultural work. But using the fundamental needs as a basis, basis uh, kind of a framework, it into our um, CASA a little bit, yeah. Um, has really been able to help set a tone that is, to me, truly inclusive yeah. instead of celebrating just Yes, a superficial I attribute. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for that. It's good to hear that. So I guess I'm not barking up the wrong tree. I might, I might be on the right path with this, I hope. Uh, I, want, I want to be respectful to your time and say it's now 3.32. And if there's someplace else you need to go, please feel free to depart. And maybe I should say thank you now. And I'll be willing to hang around for a while if anybody wants to talk about anything else. Thanks so much for choosing to come and visit.